And uh, now this particular lime kiln, which is here by the way, uh, that's the top of the flue, the firebox is here, but this has had a little hut attached to it and even the stone settee that I'm sitting on. And it, uh, this has been excavated later on uh, and there was a fire, we d discovered a fireplace here and, uh, and uh, a chimney. Uh, so that, that's been the staff canteen uh, of, the, of the lime burners. Um, this particular lime kiln uh, was vandalised, the stone was required for a road making process and this man uh, came to me at the farm and said come and see what we've discovered and, and this was the centre flue. Uh, uh, some, well you can see it, it's as tall as he is, he's a very tall man but it's at least uh, from to the top here uh, it's five feet and it's been lined with clay and, and that, uh, that is, is the centre flue inside a lime kiln that was as completely excavated and taken away for, for building a, ro a farm road. Uh, and this was my fanciful interpretation of what a, a complete lime kiln would have looked like with um, uh, the firebox down in the bottom and, and the centre flue. Uh, but you had to fill it, so usually these were built against a hillside so that you could fill it uh, from the hillside. If there was no hillside, they very often had steps up so that the, uh, the lime burner could carry the limestone and fuel up on his back and tip it in to the top. And of course the fire was lit here and then it was covered over with turf and just allowed to uh, burn quietly for, for perhaps a week uh, in order to thoroughly bake uh, the limestone without destroying it by burning. Um, now, what happened to this industry, uh, with records of it being uh, as long ago, used as long ago as 14th century, farmers collecting lime from the Shedden uh, Valley for the improving the field, uh, but there was a tremendous act activity in the 17th and 18th centuries because of all this house building. And uh, the, the shed and lime industry carried on uh, up to the building of the uh, Leeds and Liverpool Canal. Now uh, a pack horse, uh, even the shed and lime had to be carried away on pack horses and a pack horse only carried 200 weights. Uh, the general inference is that most of the shed and lime went over into Yorkshire, uh, went to uh, over to Halifax and places like that. Uh, but uh, I've known uh, some would be used locally, but the majority of it was exported across into Yorkshire. Now once the canal was built, a canal barge could bring 40 tonnes of limestone as opposed to the 200 weight on a pack horse. And what happened, uh, at Barn Oldswick there was a, a huge slab of rock called the Rain Hall Rock and the canal went right by it and a tunnel was driven into the rock from the canal and then uh, the reason for the tunnel was that there was a right of way across here uh, so that they weren't allowed to excavate that so they took the canal under a tunnel and then they started to excavate the rain hall rock by tumbling it down into canal barges and in the 80 years from the canal opening um, the canal opened roughly in about 1814 well, when the Full Ridge Tunnel was open uh, for the next 80 years uh, canal barge after canal barge brought away limestone from the Rain Hall Rock and took, brought it to Burnley and took it forward to uh, all the towns uh, in, in Lancashire, the Blackburn, Accrington, uh, etc. Now, uh, the Rain Hall Rock was a fantastic thing. This is after you've got through the tunnel. That this is the rain, the, the, the thickness of the rain hall rock. It's 110 feet thick, and they, 
all of this V-shaped defile has been excavated uh, by quarrymen, uh, excavating the limestone and tumbling it down into barges in the bottom here. And this canal went for one mile through, uh, through the rain hole rock. Uh, it, it, that was the extent in the 80 years of, of, of mining the rain hole rock. Uh, this amazing viaduct is nothing more than an accommodation uh, route that the landowner whose field, this used to be a field and of course they've dug down into the, he insisted that there be a communication from this part of the field to that part and they built this magnificent viaduct just for sheep and cattle to stroll across from one part of the field to the other. Uh, Having the barges, of course, had to come through the um, uh, Fall Ridge Tunnel, and that wasn't completed, I don't think, till about 1814. Uh, and uh, it was one mile long, so after negotiating the tunnel out of the Rain Hole Rock, it got into the main line of the canal, came through the Fall Ridge Tunnel, and then it had to go down a flight of six locks here, at Barra Ford, down flight of six locks, and then finally it arrived at Burnley on the, um, uh, the Burnley embankment. And on either side of the embankment, the canal company built uh, lime kilns. The, there's uh, five of them, uh, the, what we call, used to call the culvert, now it's the aqueduct, is here. There were five of them on this side and four on the other side. You can still see the firebox arches of these five uh, just on the right hand side of Yorkshire Street uh, where you're going up to Aford Motors. Uh, and uh, on the other side, um, Sainsbury's have reconditioned the four there and they're in the Sainsbury's car park. And these, when they lit these lime kilns at first, Burnley was obliterated uh, beneath a pall of acrid smoke and they said this won't do at all and there was an act of parliament passed almost immediately to say that all furnaces and boilers had to have a chimney at least 90 feet in height. So a chimney had to be built 90 feet high above these lime kilns uh, to take the fumes well away from the town. So that, that was the demise of the uh, shed and lime industry because they could just could not compete with this sort of competition. But it is recorded that people struggled on and not picking up lime from the Shedden area, not burning it in Shedden, but bringing uh, pack horse trains of, of limestone down from Shedden and selling the limestone to the owners of these kilns, uh, competing with the lime coming on the canal barges from Barn Oldswick. It's like the uh, handloom weavers struggling on for 50 years after the invention of the power loom. They struggled on and there was an account in the Burnley paper <coughs> of how children used to enjoy watching the lion gals arrive here and the minute the weight was taken off their back they literally pranced and danced uh, with joy at getting rid of the, of the weight as they went back empty. Uh, so that uh, I then Oh, my map on the bedroom floor, I asked a very good friend of mine, Peter Pomeroy, uh, uh, would he make it into a, a decent drawing fit to uh, get a slide of, and he, he did this drawing for me, showing everything that I've, I'd mapped, all the uh, water goits, uh, the hushings, uh, the, every lime kiln is marked on, on this map, all these marks all these lime kilns uh, and uh, this was the original circular bit that I discovered where that was taken uh, to hush the land away here and um, so uh, th that ought to be the end of my talk but I gave this talk to uh, the Burnley Historical Society and after I'd given the talk a gentleman came up to me and he said you've just ruined six months of my work I said, how could I possibly have done that? 
Well, he said it's not generally known, but the government have issued a directive uh, that the lands of the major water departments have to be developed for public recreation. He said, and for the last six months, we've been working on a plan to throw open the worst thorn moor for public recreation, for approved activities. He said, and we hadn't a clue that there was anything like this up there. He said, and obviously we can't ignore it, so we have to go back to the drawing board. So they went back to the drawing board and decided that this area of the worst thorn moor would be open for walkers, riders, orienteers, uh, etc. But this particular area had to be set on side as a, an archaeological study into um, a, a bit of industrial history. And also it was agreed that certain projects would, uh, uh, would go on each year. And for the first year the project was to investigate one of the uh, uh, water uh, uh, the water goits and the other and the other was to rebuild one of the lime kilns and an archaeologist called John Hallam was put in charge and my friend John Sharples who's with us today worked very closely indeed with John Hallam on, on this project. Uh, so I'll just show what has happened since in opening up this area uh, both for people to just look at or hopefully for groups to get together and do a certain amount of research or possibly rebuild a, a lime kiln or something like that. Now um, John Hallam uh, when he came on the job he said oh I'd been working a few years back on a project over uh, near um, uh, Wycollar above Trawden he said there was a funny building there, I took a photograph of it, he showed me the photograph and I said that's a shed and lime kiln beyond all doubt. So we went over to look at it, John and myself, and um, there it was. Uh, this, this is, a, we'd, we'd been excavating a shed and the ruins of a lime kiln and this to within two inches was of the same size and this was obviously uh, what the, the shed and lime kilns had looked like before they were vandalised for walling stone. So this was the model to use to rebuild one. Uh, and so we, we photographed this and measured it and, and used it as a model for rebuilding a lime kiln. Uh, then the question was of all the 50 lime kilns to pick the most suitable one to rebuild and uh, the two Johns picked on, on this one uh, we'd, we'd to put a bit of a fence round it because the first thing that happened was to excavate the centre flue and this was most interesting because it went down some five or six feet and when we got to the bottom there was a skeleton of, the sheep in, of a sheep in it showing that it had indeed been a danger to livestock if it had been left open. So that, that was uh, the kiln that it was decided to rebuild and it was ex this is the beginning of the excavation. Uh, the centre flue has been excavated right down to a square flag in the bottom. This was the fire hall and uh, there was, uh, the, the base was a square flag. Th this was the working floor and here, here the flue and uh, this of course the body of the kiln which had been built into one of the piles of trash so that in, to fill it up they could walk onto the top of the pile and tip, tip the materials into the flue. Uh, here's a, a, a further, further on in the process. We got some very willing helpers, uh, many of them ladies, and they scraped all this land away and the original land had been nature had built the land up to about this height and we had to excavate down some I think it would be some 12 or 15 inches to arrive at the original working floor and we've arrived at it here and there was a pile of debris here which was which was uh, trash lime of no value but obviously the good 
uh, limestone, the good cob lime had been piled here waiting for the lime gals to come and take it away. So there, uh, this was the working floor when this lime kiln was in full operation. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that's upside down. That is the lime kiln when it was rebuilt. Uh, a man, a dry stone waller called Eric Greenwood rebuilt it. And the other part of the project was to investigate one of these earth dams uh, to see how they'd built them. And uh, th this was a section taken through one of the earth dams uh, which revealed that uh, it was mainly built up to begin with, with the old peat sods. And then when they got deeper down to get some clay, uh, we'd, we'd sealed the whole thing with clay. And then of course, what we see here is the humus uh, that, had, that had grown on with the, uh, with the vegetation in the succeeding 200 years. So anyway, that was a section through one of the earth dams uh, for making the ponds. Um, now, the, the project the year after was to provide a car park. Uh, this is the car park. There was a hushing trail to take you down uh, to, to one part of the hushings. And then from there on you had the right to wander off and, and anywhere you pleased all over, all over the area. Uh, this is the beginning of the of the Hushing Trail. It says here Shedden Limestone Hushing Trail and the trail set off uh, th there uh, one of these gravel paths that they, they love so much, the, the authority. Um, and as you go down the gravel path you arrive at a, you get a leaflet from the Mechanics Institution uh, with a, a key to these various this is post number one, and here is one of the um, uh, water goits bringing water from the moor, taking it down to a pond. And John uh, had the bright idea of liming this and mowing it so as to get a nice green grass so that people, it would stand out uh, from the rest of the moor and uh, be uh, a, a better feature to see. Uh, after that, after that had crossed over the uh, the gravel path, it went d down here to feed a pond down there, and then the next uh, uh, post here was indicating uh, the um, earthen dam that that had impounded a pond here. But peat has a habit of growing every year; it grows a certain distance every year. Uh, so that although at one time that would have been a pond perhaps a yard deep, today the peat has grown so much that uh, it's a little difficult to imagine it being a pond. But there's no mistake in the earthen dam, which isn't peat but clay. And uh, here is where the, the, the head race is taken uh, by means of an embankment. It, it's taken across a little valley uh, to go around there to form a whole area of Hushings uh, along which the Hushing Trail goes. This is uh, showing one, one of the Hushings as it is today that is. And, uh, but, but you also arrive at a point here at the top of the Drove Road and uh, another uh, project of Manpower Services people was to rebuild the walls of this drove road that runs through the Cliviger enclosures. Another um, project was to throw a fence around the old plantation so that it would regenerate itself. Uh, so the old plant and all that is described in the, these notice boards. Now here you have a choice of either going down the drove road and looking at the drove road and the old plantation or carrying along the hushing trail on here. And uh, that's where the hushing trail goes down the drove road. Not the hushing trail, the drove road, yeah. You can see 
uh, and when they got to there they ran out of material so it ends there more or less. But you can see that the walls on either side, if you remember those earlier pictures of this drove road, the walls were only uh, about 18 inches high and in ruins. But now they've been rebuilt pretty well all the way down. Which, uh, and uh, this is the Hushing Trail coming along and it goes to an observation point there where now there is a stone plinth and uh, a drawing uh, of a map type drawing of, of all the features you can see from that observation point but the Hushing Trail dips down one of the Hushings here and this Hushing has been completely blocked off by rhododendrons so the manpower services people hacked the way through it and made a rather exciting uh, tunnel uh, through the rhododendrons as you can see uh, that, that takes you down there's the observation point and that's off down through the rhododendrons eventually those will meet across and you'll be you'll be going through a really dark tunnel down there uh, as you can see we're coming coming down it here and it finally takes us out uh, into a, an area of of the Hushings where there's all stone trash and the rebuilt lime kiln is here. Uh, so the, the present Hushing trail ends with at the last post at the rebuilt lime kiln, um, which happily I've got the correct way up. <laughs> so that, that is the, the end of the Hushing trail that's come down here. Uh, to this rebuilt kiln. And that is my last slide. You'll be relieved to hear. <laughs> it is the last, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Well, it certainly was a mystery, and I found it fascinating. Not least because my wife used to live at the Causeway House, the gamekeeper's lodge up on the long Causeway. So that's added a little bit of extra. And it's a bit unfortunate that the mother-in-law who is normally here is not here tonight, so she'd have been very interested also. She'll see, see the video. Yeah. 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 Yes. I mean, thank you very much, Tad. I realise that Burnley without you would have been less oh. of a town than what it is. Mm. And of course it takes a man like Titus uh, to bring these things to our knowledge. And it's for this reason that we're making these videos because I'm sure without him talking, the slides themselves could not be explained. And so I really do thank him very much for these lectures. And tomorrow night there is something that's equally as interesting, I think, uh, which is to do with something that was found recently, if yeah. you recollect. And yeah. um, this is charcoal burning in Holmes, <laughs> charcoal glass furnacing in Holmes Chapel, which is again is another subject about the geology and the history of Burnley. So I'll just put the lights on, and then perhaps if you want to ask any questions, I will do so. Mm. <coughs> mm. We're going over first, is it Thurston, Thurston Valley? Thurston Valley. On, on the right, you can see these rather... Yes. Yeah. What I... Yes, yeah. Yes. What I ought to have explained is that you get these features in all the valleys around the northeast uh, of Burnley, Briarfield, Nelson and Cone. You get them, the Shedden Valley is this, this end and right through to Wycollar beyond Cone. And you get them in every valley, uh, but the Shedden one is far and away the biggest and the best. So that's why, well I concentrated on the Shedden one because yeah. I lived there, well, you I mean, see. You know, that, uh, uh, going on the normal road, yeah. that's the point we but, but, uh, the rock on there, yeah. well, obviously it would have been man-made. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't have known. Yeah. Mm. And they've all worked on this system, there's headwaters and ponds and hushings and then down in the bottom you get the lime like how did the valley fare you know in the um, late what 40s early 50s a lot of uh, open cast mining weren't they 
near there somewhere. Y yeah. That's mine. I mean, they turned that thing into a, a moonscape, didn't they, in the, the uh, early 50s, if you went along the... Oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Was, uh, yes, yes. Mm. But it seems to have survived that. Oh, way. yes, the, the, this, uh, the Shedden Valley area wasn't oh, touched. Wasn't touched. There was no coal under, under there, no. The coal was just a bit further over on the moon, like over the other side of the long causeway. Yes, yeah. Mm. Is all this tight as part of the extension of the Cliviger Gorge where there is a geological well, fault or interest? Is it was the, uh, this, this part of Shedden, the extension of the Well, uh, well it, it, it was interesting in that uh, uh, the ma the glacier melted there, and uh, the meltwater ran through into the Cliviger Gorge. So as you come along the long causeway, you've got odd places where the meltwater from the sh shed was it would be a lake full of water, you see, uh, running over the long causeway and down into this. And it, it was all that meltwater that deepened uh, the Cliviger Gorge when it goes down through Cornholm and uh, it, you know, it gets much deeper and winding down through Cornholm towards Donmadin. And the, there are these melt, there are these glacial